Hi everyone, this is Dr. Young, uh, Intro to Africa at Flagler College. Um, our discussion today is about the Atlantic slave trade. Um, and uh, this is, of course, one of the most fraught of all of the topics we will cover this semester. Um, it has uh, understandably very strong emotional resonance um, and uh, you know is a, a very troubling part of um, not only the history of Africa but really the history of the world um, and you know I mean there are legacies of course in the United States of America um, lots of uh, people in this country um, trace their their ancestry back to people who were forcibly brought to the Americas as slaves um, and so, you know, it's understandable that there is, I mean, there's a lot of emotional content to this. Um, it's one of those topics that I don't take lightly, uh, certainly. But um, I also uh, know that this is a topic that we could wade into and spend an entire semester on. And in fact, um, there are classes taught at Flagler and other institutions of higher education, specifically on institutions of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, um, and slavery both in Africa and in the Americas. And so um, I am not going to try to give a kind of comprehensive treatment of this, nor will I um, uh, really delve into the primary sources. I did assign you to read um, uh, uh, Alaudua Equiano's um, a portion of his work called The Interesting Narrative. Um, Equiano was taken as a slave uh, from Africa. He records some of his experiences in the slave port and on what's called the Middle Passage um, on, the, on the ship. Uh, he later um, gained freedom and wrote down his account. And it's, it's really kind of standard reading in uh, courses on slavery. Um, and so hopefully you're able to, to glean something out of that. Um, really, I'm going to limit this discussion to two, uh, two points. One on the origins of slavery, and then uh, I shouldn't say two points, because I'm going to bring up a number of issues that have animated scholarship on this um, and uh, try to take you through some of those without necessarily treating them in any kind of comprehensive fashion. Um, if you have questions or there are other issues that you'd like to raise um, after watching this, then please bring those up on the discussion boards. Um, would love to uh, continue the conversation there. So first, the question of origins is a fraught one, and um, uh, it relates to some of the issues here. But uh, suffice it to say that slavery was an institution found in just about every part of the world anciently. Um, you know, the lands that we now refer to as Europe or the Mediterranean certainly had slave systems. Uh, there were slaves in Africa anciently. Uh, there were slaves in the Middle East. Um, there are definitely slave systems in other places um, outside of the kind of uh, Europe, Africa, Old World, uh, or I should say Eurasian, African, Old World. Um, and so, you know, slavery is, is uh, a, unless, I don't want to, you know, kind of uh, denigrate this by saying it's a common human institution. I, I don't think it ever should have been a human institution, but it was very common in the ancient world. Um, even texts like the Bible, not only uh, mention slavery, but they also sort of give directions to slaves that they should be loyal to their masters, that they shouldn't try to run away, um, uh, kind of accepting that slavery is just an institution. It doesn't necessarily justify the institution of slavery, though certainly lots of people over the centuries have tried to use that and other important texts to justify this, um, but it does acknowledge it as something that exists. Now, that said, the association between Africa and slavery, or even more uh, specifically between people of uh, dark-skinned peoples and slavery is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, 
uh, in Europe, for instance, back you know into the ancient world, back into ancient Greece and Rome, there were slave systems. Not well, I shouldn't. It's not appropriate even to say not all slaves were from Africa. Very few slaves were from Africa. Uh, the Romans took slaves from lots of different people, um, war captives, as well as you know people who had uh, gotten in trouble with the law could be condemned to slavery for a time or perhaps for their entire lives. Uh, there are prominent slaves in the Roman Empire. Um, uh, most gladiators, in fact, just about all gladiators, were slaves. Uh, they represented a huge investment for their owners who not only bought them, but also had to um, uh, feed and train them as, you know, elite athletes, really, to compete in the arenas in Rome. Um, if you uh, have watched films, for instance, about ancient Rome, you may think that, you know, the emperor, just depending on what he, how he felt that day, would say, oh, I want this gladiator to die, or I want him to live. Uh, actually, it didn't happen in quite so flippant a fashion. Um, gladiators, again, were a huge investment, and the emperor, you know, would have to probably have some, or whoever was in charge of the games, would have to have some justification for sending a gladiator to his death, um, be, and, and possibly even have to compensate or arrange for compensation for the owner of that gladiator, right? Gladiators were often celebrities. Um, and so this is not a course on Roman slavery or, or Roman games or anything like that, but just to show that, you know, there were, I mean, slaves sometimes held fairly prominent positions. Now, in the early Middle Ages, uh, and we know this thanks to the excellent work by the, um, the Harvard historian Michael McCormick, um, uh, Western Europe, the lands controlled by the Germanic kingdoms of uh, Western Europe at the time, that had replaced Rome um, uh, were one of the chief suppliers to the world market of slaves, because there was a lot of warfare between different peoples, and uh, you know, uh, in the ancient world at least, slaves tend tended to come largely from war captives. Now, there, you know, uh, Africa was linked into that in some ways, and so some slaves did come from Africa. But there wasn't uh, necessarily any kind of stigma placed on Africans that they were uh, deserving of enslavement just because of who they were um, or something so superficial and tried as the color of their skin, right? Um, now, in Africa, um, and, and all of that is to say that you know, slavery was common even in places that eventually, uh, for the most part, did the enslaving. Um, uh, in fact, all through, if I can just continue that, that line for a minute, um, all through the Middle Ages in Europe, there were people who were unfree. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that they were bought and sold in markets um, like cattle, uh, but they were unfree um, and were subject to uh, the various laws and traditions and things that govern unfreedom or unfree people. Um, they owed obligations to their owners and, uh, you know, the, the term serf in the Middle Ages, for instance, comes from the Latin word servus. It's a um, put into the vernacular, uh, uh, becomes serf. It means servus in Latin me uh, meant anciently and in the Middle Ages uh, meant slave. It did not mean servant um, uh, or anything like that, right? It didn't mean peasant. It meant slave. Um, and so serfs were unfree. Um, now, as of about the 12th or 13th century, people in Western Europe began to preach against slavery and against serfdom um, and to manumit or free their serfs or their slaves. But that was not necessarily done out of altruistic or Christian uh, uh, motivations. That was um, because uh, the money economy had taken the place of a barter and uh, in-kind based economy earlier. Um, and uh, uh, serfs didn't necessarily produce money. Um, the nobles who, uh, who owned serfs, who controlled serfs, wanted money, and they were more likely to get money by uh, renting out land to tenant farmers than they were uh, forcing serfs to work the land, and the, you know, the, the nobles would have to do that. So they would have to take the, the produce uh, from that work and sell it themselves, and it was easier 
um, to make the peasants do that, uh, fulfill that kind of role. Um, okay, so enough about slavery in Europe. Uh, hopefully you get the point that, um, you know, Europe was not without slavery, uh, really kind of right up to the point where Europeans begin to uh, deal in African slaves in fairly large numbers. There were still indigenous slaves in Europe. Now in Africa, uh, slavery was an institution in many parts of Africa, all the way back to the ancient worlds, uh, particularly uh, slaves were common, um, uh, taken as mostly again as war captives um, and traded across the Sahara into the Mediterranean, uh, into, well, anciently into the Roman Empire, into the Greek uh, city-states, um, into uh, probably the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt and, and some of these places. Uh, when Islam took over, lots of African slaves, you know, were taken across the Sahara and sold in slave markets in, in places like Algiers and Tripoli um, and Cairo. Um, and uh, sometimes shipped off to other points beyond that in the Middle East um, or other parts of the Mediterranean. Um, did Africans own slaves and use slaves for farm labor in sub-Saharan Africa? Probably, though um, that, you know, it doesn't mean that it was a permanent institution or that it, um, uh, was a hereditary uh, status or anything like that. There was probably infinite variation of slavery um, across the continent. And, uh, you know, some of that slavery tied into the markets uh, across the Sahara or on the East African coast, um, and some of it indigenous uh, and kept within the African societies of the interior of the continent. Um, and so, yes, Africa had slavery, just like other parts of the world, and there was great variation in the kind of slavery that existed um, uh, in Africa. Some of it chattel slavery, some, you know, uh, really just a kind of extension of dependent relationships and, and things like this. In fact, we did uh, talk in previous classes about, you know, some slave-owning uh, societies, um, the Songhai Empire, as well as Kanem and the Hausa states and others, uh, relied on on slave labor to, to work the farms. At least the powerful landowners, um, who also tended to be pastoralists, you know, uh, controlled slaves. Possibly some of that in the Great Lakes region and other places as well. Um, and it's and it's quite possible, and I think probable, that with the Bantu migrations uh, spreading to southern Africa that uh, the Khoisan peoples uh, were probably um, taken as war captives by the Bantu and enslaved uh, to some extent. And um, uh, those who were not able to get away um, probably were exploited in that fashion, right? Okay, so uh, I think that that's a pretty exhaustive coverage of the origins of slavery in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, uh, it's really not until um, uh, you know, the Portuguese began to um, explore the western coast of Africa. Um, and this is often told as a story of the Portuguese simply trying to find a way to India, uh, that nothing actually could be further from the truth. They were not, I mean, they were interested in India, but they were just as interested in the western coast of Africa um, because they knew there were massive gold deposits and that uh, slaves came from there. Um, across the Sahara, and they wanted to cut out the trans-Saharan middlemen. Um, and so this is one of the things that motivated Prince Henry the Navigator, the Prince of Portugal, to start a, a school for um, kind of maritime technology and, and uh, naval, naval techniques, naval training, um, uh, seafaring school, right, um, in the first half of the 15th century. Um, and uh, the Portuguese, you know, by the middle of the 15th century, were already sending ships well down the coast of Africa. Uh, they, you know, they reached the Congo River Basin probably by the 1460s, 1470s, um, and uh, did tap into gold reserves there, um, gold deposits. Uh, but they also began to take slaves, and from that point on, the Europeans became involved in this. Right. And, and those are the origins of the transatlantic slave trade. And the Portuguese initiated this, but the Spanish were not far behind them. And pretty soon 
you know, the French, uh, the Dutch, and the English also uh, got in on the act um, and, uh, you know, began to um, trade in slaves that they obtained uh, in ports along the western coast um, of Africa. Um, now, on to some issues here. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, really these are issues that have to deal with the transatlantic slave trade, which runs roughly from the late 15th through the uh, middle of the 19th century. So for about 500 years, um, though, you know, for the first 100 to 200 years of that, uh, things were really just picking up. They, they weren't, there wasn't a high volume of slaves traded. Uh, from Africa. Um, it's really, you know, the 18th century is uh, the, the point of highest volume, uh, tapering off in the 19th century because of abolition uh, taking hold first in Britain and then in other, other uh, countries. So issues. Um, one of the big ones, and this is something that has animated scholars for a couple of generations, um, and uh, really carries with it a lot of emotional resonance is the question of indigenous versus external. Was slavery something indigenous that the Europeans simply happened to tap into? Um, uh, or was this something introduced by the Europeans? Now, hopefully you can see um, from a certain viewpoint at least, why that question is kind of absurd, right? Really, this is all about blame. Who is to blame for the slave trade? Um, now, I think that the best answer here, and, you know, this is really kind of glossing over all of the huge volumes of ink that have been spilled on this issue, but the, the quick answer is it's both, right? Um, there were native indigenous Africans who captured slaves, even made a point of sending out armies with the express purpose of capturing slaves. Uh, there were slave systems in Africa even before the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade started. But on the other hand, if the Europeans hadn't been interested in this and, and in so many ways putting pressure on the Africans, uh, then the volume of slaves would never have reached what it the the proportion that it did the numbers that it did, and um, you know that we wouldn't have had this uh, kind of process of shipping the slaves uh, in very cruel inhumane manner across the sea to the Americas, forcing them you know away from their their native lands into strange places, uh, in many cases working them to death on sugar plantations. Um, none of that would have come about. Would slavery still have been an institution in Africa? Yes. Would it have been cruel and inhumane? Yes. Would it have reached the levels that it did? Definitely not. Um, uh, though there was demand for slaves, you know, in other parts of the world, it's um, really the the European, I'm never going to call it, I, I would not call this a discovery without qualifying it because there are plenty of people living in the Americas, of course, but um, the European uh, interaction, the encounter of the Europeans with the Americas, let's put it that way, um, uh, is one of the things, uh, the, one of the main factors really that uh, pushed this to the level that it reached. Um, and so, you know, scholars have thankfully, and I think to some extent the public, although I think this, this is probably still a debate in public or, you know, people uh, may, without being aware kind of of the details may, you know, come down on one side or the other here. But thankfully, uh, we're beginning to move beyond that question of who is to blame, right? Um, numbers. This is another question that is just fraught. Uh, with all kinds of emotional baggage, right? Because it comes down to the question of how bad was it? And really that is all about, you know, if somebody is to blame and somebody must be to blame, whether it's the native Africans or the Europeans here, then how much blame do we lay at their feet, right? 
Um, and the numbers question really gets going, and I'm not sure, I'm not even aware that there was much debate about numbers previous to about the 1950s or 60s, probably 1960s and 70s really is the heyday of this issue. And that has a lot to do with certain other numbers that had become part of public discourse, um, specifically the number 6 million as a descriptor for the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust by the Nazis, right? Um, you know, that uh, was seen, understandably, as the greatest atrocity in human history by so many people, and the number 6 million really began to resonate. Um, that number is, um, is I think, uh, certainly open for debate. Um, it may be higher, it may be lower, and to some extent, I think that the numbers question is, is sort of ridiculous, right? I mean, it, these are horrific things we're talking about, uh, whether the number is, you know, much smaller than that or much, much higher than that. Um, but uh, in any case, you know, when it comes to the numbers uh, in Africa, um, certain scholars, and these tended to be uh, people based in Africa, you know, came up with astronomically high numbers for uh, for the number of slaves taken, uh, you know, via the transatlantic slave trade. Others, and, uh, you know, tending to be non-Africans, uh, tended to put the numbers much lower. Um, and uh, really the numbers, you know, mind you, this reflects the number of slaves taken over a four to five hundred year period. The lowest estimates put it somewhere between 8 and 10 million. The highest estimates put it as much as 25 million. Okay, that's how far apart the various camps are with a lot of numbers in the middle, right? Now, I think that thankfully we've begun to move beyond the numbers debate. Um, and really, I say thankfully because um, I think that Really, the key here is just acknowledging that this is this is horrific. This is absolutely terrible, uh, inhumane, cruel. Um, that there there's plenty of blame to go around, uh, and plenty of blame certainly needs to be laid at the feet of Europeans. Um, uh, but we shouldn't that shouldn't blind us to the uh, realities on the ground in Africa all, all through this period, right? Um, uh, where there was often you know uh, an intensely cruel kind of streak. Uh, in, in many political entities uh, that were geared toward uh, capturing slaves and selling them on this international market. Um, but uh, the numbers game is, um, I mean, it's obvious there were a lot of people taken. Uh, that is a fairly long period of time. Um, uh, the other thing that's related to, but, you know, all of it's a tragedy, right? The other thing is related to the numbers question, by the way, is um, the impact that this had on Africa. Um, I, I said at the very beginning of the course that um, when Af Native African historians began to work on African history in the, in the 1960s, one of the questions that they brought up was the question of the, under the purposeful underdevelopment of Africa, right? And of course, slavery was key to that argument um, that Europe by taking slaves specifically, purposefully underdeveloped Africa or uh, retarded the development of Africa. Um, and uh, um, again, you know, the lower estimate debates say, well, this is, you know, I mean, a lot of people were taken, but, um, you know, this was, uh, these people were essentially replaceable or the resources were such that, you know, because they were taken, there was enough to go around or, or whatever it was. The people who estimate higher uh, tend to say that um, this led to gross underdevelopment, that Africa was really doing well, but because of slavery, um, it was checked in its advances and the rest of the world, especially Europe, outpaced it um, because so many Africans who might have been innovators and, uh, you know, uh, really kind of changers to the society, been influential and helped it develop, uh, were taken off to the Americas and died, you know, farming sugar or whatever. Okay. 
No, um, more recently really is, is we've gotten beyond these questions of the indigenous versus external and the numbers. Um, other more, I think, I think more substantive uh, questions have been raised and issues have been treated. Uh, one of these is the kind of the regions, right? Um, both the regions from which slaves were taken in Africa and the regions to which they went in the Americas. And the map here on the slide, I think, um, you know, does a pretty good job kind of looking at this. Uh, first of all, the one easier to treat is the Americas. Um, you know, we might have the perception because, um, you know, so much of this debate has been conducted in the United States that a huge number of slaves went to North America. Well, you can see here that British North America only received about 4% um, of all of the slaves taken over 400 years. Um, the vast majority of them went either to the West Indies, uh, the islands of the Caribbean, where they were primarily put to work farming uh, on sugar plantations, laboring on sugar plantations, um, or to Brazil, where sugar and coffee and other labor-intensive crops uh, were cultivated. Um, and so those are the two places that uh, received the largest number of slaves. And the ones who took the most slaves were, well, in Brazil, it was the Portuguese, um, uh, but in the West Indies, this would have been British and French um, and Spanish to some extent. Um, about 12 to 15 percent end up in Spanish, uh, kind of Latin America here, right, between Spanish South America and, um, um, well, actually the Guianas, that this is partly French too, so, um, uh, and even to some extent English, kind of on the coast of South Africa here. So, you know, the British um, and the French and uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese all have some culpability here. They were all involved in the slave trade. Um, the Dutch were as well. The Dutch have some presence in the West Indies too. Um, now, the more important question for our purposes here are, is uh, where did they come from in Africa? Well, initially the slave trade was conducted mostly just along the western coast here, um, above the above the Bight of Biafra, above the Gold Coast in the Senegambia region. Um, uh, but it gradually moved, um, and by the you know the 17th and into the 18th centuries. Uh, Lots and lots of slaves were taken from the Gold Coast and over here into the Niger Delta region, uh, the countries that are now, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, um, these places. Um, and uh, already by the late 16th century, there were lots of slaves taken from the Kingdom of Congo. Um, I've talked about that a little bit. Um, uh, but maybe the area affected most because the Portuguese were... Uh, I think of all of the countries of Europe, um, they probably extracted the largest number of slaves from Africa was Angola. Um, now, notice that there are large parts of Africa here that were not necessarily involved in the transatlantic slave trade. That doesn't mean the slaves are not taken from these places. Um, the only other place really that was systematically... Uh, uh, I hesitate to use the word mind, um, you know, want to mind human beings here, but um, uh, where slaves were, were culled from, and this came rather late in the game uh, as the Portuguese were uh, kind of hiding their activities or trying to move their activities away from the British uh, who were actively seeking to disrupt the slave trade was over here in, you know, what is now Mozambique and Tanzania and, and uh, to some extent in Madagascar. Um, this is rather late in the transatlantic slave trade, really kind of 19th century, okay? So the largest number taken from Angola, um, uh, probably the best book I have ever read on the transatlantic slave trade is Joseph Miller's Way of Death, which is about the kind of direct shot from uh, the Angola region here uh, to Brazil, largely in Portuguese hands. Um, and uh, just a huge number of slaves taken in the 18th and 19th centuries from there and shipped over to Brazil. Um, so not all regions of the continent were affected equally, but uh, the regions that did become heavily involved in the slave trade were influenced irrevocably, irrevocably by this. Um, their political systems were totally disrupted and really kind of reconfigured to serve the needs of the slave trade. Um, there were 
entire kingdoms really whose uh, political purpose or their their whole um, uh, way of life revolved around uh, fighting against other you know surrounding peoples and taking slaves and they had uh, you know very uh, harsh punitive systems that uh, left their own people in slavery in many cases um, and uh, you know that the and that that kind of influence of the slave trade really is germane only for this part of the western coast of Africa. Um, another issue, state destruction and creation. States were destroyed or made in many cases by the slave trade, right? This is especially the case for, well, again, for all of this, but you know, for these lands up here, uh, the Gold Coast and over here into what was once called the Slave Coast, um, uh, you know, Nigeria and, and uh, Benin and, and places like that. Um, there were whole kingdoms, in fact, that uh, relied on their, most of their economy relied on the taking of slaves and selling them to Europeans on the continent. Uh, some interesting kind of examples. Um, uh, there's a kingdom in... Um, uh, what is now Benin and Togo? Um, I can't remember exactly where this is at. It's one of it's either one of those two countries or, or kind of both of them together. Uh, but it was called Dahomey, and uh, uh, Dahomey um, had as one of its key features an army made up of female warriors. These were known as the Amazons of Dahomey. And uh, these Amazons were reputed to be the fiercest warriors, you know, in in the region. Um, and their whole purpose was to seek out villages that hadn't been raided yet, and uh, and extract slaves from them, and march them off to uh, the coastline. Uh, there's a really wonderful film um, that I show in my pre-modern Africa class about Dahomey. Um, it's made in Africa. It is, you know, shot entirely with African actors. Uh, there's not, there's not a single European in this film. Um, it's called Adangaman. Um, that is one I highly recommend watching. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic film, though you do have to go in with the expectation that acting standards um, and acting kind of techniques are different in Africa than they are you know, in the Western world, um, if, you, if you're able to do that, I mean, it's extremely well acted, uh, very well directed, and tells a really compelling story, a really tragic story, a really compelling story um, about, you know, Dahomey in the, in the 18th century, um, featuring these, you know, these Amazon warriors. Um, uh, there were states that were destroyed as well, um, with these new states like Dahomey and Segu, and Ashanti, uh, all of these in this area um, uh, along the Gold Coast here, um, and the, close to the Bada Biafra. Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm going to correct myself. Dahomey is right here on what is known as the uh, the Bight of Benin, and so it, it does correspond with Benin. Uh, that is the old that is the old kingdom of Dahomey, and I will um, look that up and, and try to correct myself. I'm having a brain lapse here when it comes to that. The other place where um, there were a lot of kind of slave-taking states created was down here in Angola, understandably, right? But there were also slave, there were also um, kingdoms and uh, political entities destroyed by this. The kingdom of the Congo um, suffered greatly and was thrown into total disarray. Uh, I mentioned in an earlier earlier lecture this instance where this woman named Doña Beatriz um, uh, believed that she was the um, had sort of channeling the spirit of Saint Anthony. Um, the ancient Egyptian desert father, right, um, and that she was to lead her people, the people of the kingdom of the Congo, to freedom from the slave takers, and, you know, this ended up, and the, the Mbanza Congo, um, the king of Congo, in other words, uh, was kind of in cahoots with the Europeans to some extent um, in, uh, you know, um, filling slave quotas already, I mean, this is in the late 16th century, but already some of that is happening, and, uh, you know, this, this whole place was disrupted terribly by that. Um, uh, even more so, you know, re, uh, in the Senegambia region, the Gold Coast, and the, the, Bight, of, uh, the Bight of Biafra, uh, all of these places, you know, there were kingdoms that were made and unmade, really, by the slave trade. 
Uh, another issue that we should bring up is um, what is known as the Columbian Exchange. I think I've used that term several times already. Um, it really is, this is a what's known as the triangular trade, right? And so um, the, the two of the three uh, sides of the triangle, I think, are pretty obvious, right? The Americas get African slaves, right? Huge numbers of them over the course of four centuries. Europeans get all of the produce that was grown, and this is primarily agricultural, though there was some mining as well done with slaves, silver mining especially um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, but mostly agriculture. Uh, Europe gets all of that, right? They get, and, and these are new world crops too, and so, you know, Europe is benefiting from stuff they didn't have before, like sugar and coffee and tobacco, um, and, uh, you know, other things like that. Those three especially are the, the ones, cotton to some extent later on, of course. Um, these are the crops that, that are labor intensive and worked by large numbers of slaves. Uh, and so Europe grows very rich with this, right? The question that I always ask at this point is, okay, what did Africa get then? I mean, they didn't just ship slaves out for free. Um, the rulers of these you know, slave-taking uh, political entities like Dahomey and Segu and Ashanti uh, wanted something from the Europeans. And, uh, you know, my experience has been that students kind of fish around for this. Um, uh, one of the things, you know, they, they first usually the first one they come up with is guns, right? Uh, Europeans supplied guns to these places uh, so that they became more effective at um, hunting down slaves, uh, at fighting against their neighbors and taking slaves from rival kingdoms. Um, uh, these guns tended to be things that were um, no longer in use in Europe or that had gone out of fashion, gone out of uh, kind of their technological cycles. Many of them didn't work very well, uh, but guns were a major commodity. Um, and the other major commodity that Africa received, I shouldn't say Africa, really the, the ones who brokered these slave trades in Africa, um, the kings of places like Dahomey and Segu, um, or the elite individuals who um, ran armies, right? They received guns and they received booze, alcohol. Uh, rum and other things. The Europeans certainly were not sending their best um, Bordeaux wine or anything like that off to Africa. This was cheap rum. And so, you know, that, that often leads to the kind of um, very judgmental but understandable um, scoffing that, well, Africa sold millions of its people for for uh, guns that barely worked and cheap booze, right? But you have to think like um, an African political figure here in the pre-modern world to understand why those things were important. Well, let's remember that political authority in Africa is all about power over people. Hopefully you said that with me by this point. Power over people. Okay. How do you achieve power over people? Well, you create incentives. Incentives might be coercive, and guns would be a very effective means of coercing people. Okay, but on the other hand, you know it's power for people. So why would you send so many people off uh, to another part of the world where you're never going to see them again? The answer is that they're not the people you want to have power over. Right, the people that these rulers wanted to have power over were their own people especially the networks of related and dependent um, peoples, uh, the other elites of the society or whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, guns in that case would not be the primary motivator, the primary uh, thing that creates the linkage, but gifts of alcohol and other, you know, kind of cheap European products, beads and um, uh, textiles and some other things like that, would be an effective means of um, 
uh, creating these networks of uh, th these linkages between people, between the ruler and his subjects. Okay, if he's delivering nice things that come from some distant land by these strange and perhaps magical, sorry, uh, perhaps magical peoples that they may or may not have seen these these light skinned peoples, right? Um, uh, then you know they're. It mu times must be good. Um, we must be doing something right. Uh, we we want to stay close to the ruler. And so, you know, the Atlantic transatlantic slave trade, the the goods coming into Africa gave those who wielded power the means to provide incentives to their people to continue to be part of the system that they had constructed. Okay. Um, hopefully that was clear. Hopefully that's understandable. Um, it makes sense at least, right? Now, recent scholarship has focused a great deal on the slave experience, and we could, to some extent, I think, take this back to um, probably the 1970s, um, you know, with the realization, uh, beginnings of realization of some of the civil rights uh, in the Americas, um, though certainly not a complete realization, um, but uh, some of the realization of civil rights um, and this very, these very strong um, kind of heritage connections that many African Americans began to feel to their African heritage. Um, and there was one particular African American author named Alex Haley who uh, did some digging into his ancestry um, and when the information became unclear, he decided in a way to kind of make things up. Um, and so he more or less invented, I mean, he did trace it back to the, you know, to the slaves on the plantations in the southern United States. Uh, but he kind of made up the African heritage of these people, um, claiming that he was descended from a guy uh, whose African name was Kunta Kinte. And um, gone to you know to have been taken as a slave, gone to a plantation in in the south, in the southern United States, and uh, you know was given the name of Toby. Um, and this is uh, Alex Haley's book called Roots was made into an eight part mini series in the 1970s that was at that point one of the most watched uh, television programs of all time. Um, and uh, at one point, all eight episodes of Roots, I think, were in the top 20 of most watched uh, TV events uh, of all time in the United States. Um, things later came to light that Alex Haley had, you know, kind of fabricated a, a great deal of that. Um, but, you know, this still really resonated with people, and they wanted to know about the experience that people had uh, as slaves. Um, uh, the Equiano source became very popular right around the same time. And, um, and there have been a number of studies um, uh, of some of these things. And, and really, I think some of it's pretty good scholarship, you know, where uh, it's, it's empathetic and, um, you know, doesn't pull punches necessarily about the cruelties of the system, but also tries to humanize uh, the people who were enslaved. Um, another question, another issue that has been raised really in more recent times, the issue of gender. Uh, the slave trade was totally imbalanced when it came to gender. Um, far more men were taken than women. Uh, far more young people, young men especially, were taken than older people because they were the ones most suited for, uh, as the Europeans saw it at least, for the kind of work that slaves were forced to do on um, you know, agricultural plantations. Um, and so... Uh, that imbalance led to, um, uh, I guess we could say, problems on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. You know, um, the lack of, uh, well, any kind of family structure um, because of the lack of marriage partners um, in the Americas, certainly, um, but also because of laws and practices that kept, you know, um, families from forming among slave communities. Um, but also a huge imbalance in Africa where so many of the young men were taken and thus women didn't have eligible marriage partners has probably exacerbated the, um, uh, 
the institution of, of polygyny uh, made it uh, even more the case that men would take multiple wives um, and probably led to the further denigration of women as a result of that. Though, on the other hand, uh, women, because they outnumbered men, probably in some societies were able to exert greater agency um, than women, you know, where the, the distribution was more equitable. Um, so gender is, a, is an important consideration here. Also, the differences in experience of men and women in, in the slave trade, and, and for that matter, of children, right? There have been good, there been some pretty good scholarship about children uh, in slavery. Um, but, um, you know, women, of course, faced uh, trials as slaves that were different from men. Um, that's not to say necessarily more horrific, but... Um, you know, certainly the uh, the issue of sexual violation, rape um, of female slaves was much higher, uh, not non-existent among male slaves, but uh, much higher among female slaves, and that, of course, is horrific. But you know, female slaves also tended to do uh, well. Their their roles were different in many cases from the male slaves who were sent out to the you know into the fields, into the sugar plantations, uh, the coffee plantations. Uh, women were often kept as, as household slaves, um, uh, and you know, in some in some cases, were closer to the uh, the owners, um, both physically and you know, perhaps even like emotionally. Um, and so, you know, there are consequences of uh, gender has as consequences certainly um, in you know a number of consequences um, when it comes to slavery. Um, rebellion and flight. This is another issue that is, uh, you know, somewhat fraught. Um, uh, there was this perception, largely among Europeans, that Africans really didn't resist slavery. That this was, you know, they expected this or something like that. That it was a natural state for them. And this is going back, you know, into kind of the racist past of um, uh, of the West. Um, but uh, um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, cases of slave rebellion that have been dug up by historians, and some of these represent uh, incredible acts of bravery. Um, but I think it is probably the case that rebellions were not as frequent or as common as you might expect them to be, you know, just looking at this superficially. But then we have to ask why, right? Why did, why did slaves not rebel more frequently? Well, because I mean, there are lots of explanations, but I think the obvious one is they were in unfamiliar circumstances, had no idea what they would do with themselves if they did rebel, right? I mean, they were packed onto ships. What are they going to do, you know, in the in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean if they take over the ship? And some there were some cases where slaves did take over the ships and effectively sail them into some friendly port. The the film Amistad, uh, made by Steven Spielberg back in the 1990s uh, was is a good example uh, of one of these stories, um, but um, you know I mean mutiny on a ship is is a difficult thing of course. Um, uh, so is mutiny in a an African slave port, though that's probably the most common place for it to happen because you know as the slaves are being loaded onto a ship, they know that this is their last chance, and so there there were frequent or at least more frequent rebellions there. Uh, there are some slave revolts in the Americas, even some fairly high-profile ones, including uh, eventually the um, you know slaves uh, or former slaves in in Haiti uh, rising up and overthrowing their masters and establishing an independent um, state there governed by former slaves. You know, Toussaint Louverture and and uh, the the Haitian slave revolt of 1791 is this really remarkable instance of revolt. Um, so, you know, lots of information about this has been uncovered, but still it's understandable why it did not occur on a constant basis because, I mean, it's just very difficult, you know, if somebody is taken totally away from their surrounding, their familiar circumstances, uh, that, I mean, it's, it's difficult to try to get oriented enough to, uh, organize rebellion, you know, or even participate in one. Um, lots of recent scholarship, and by recent I mean last 20, 30 years, on the Middle Passage. Um, and, you know, here's where we get into really horrific stuff. Um, uh, I would say that the uh, the slave ships were 
in a way similar, in many ways, similar to the conditions present in ghettos and concentration camps during the Nazi Holocaust. Um, the bottom image here on the slide is a diagram um, of how to, uh, this was in use by, you know, slave captains, slave ship captains, uh, for how to pack the human cargo onto the ship. And if you can look closely at this and see how many people are jammed into the the hold, the cargo hold of the ship, and then onto the, you know, this, well, so if there are multiple uh, levels on a ship, um, how they would pack these people in. They had almost no space, and they were shackled in. Um, they were uh, fed very little, really kind of survival rations. Um, they were allowed to, you know, go and uh, answer the call of nature maybe once or twice a day. And understandably, in these horrific conditions, uh, many of them became sick, uh, you know, um, and uh, the the human excrement, uh, urine, and other things that they lived in. I mean, they're literally living in their own filth, right? Um, uh, in the in the, the worst, most dehumanized circumstances possible. I think um, uh, slave ship owners. Um, reckoned, they, they calculated in expected losses. Um, they expected that they would lose, and, and you know, there are different um, sources for this, but you know, some of them talk about an ex acceptable loss as being uh, at around, I think, 30% of all of the cargo. So they expected that 30% of the slaves would die in route and have to be thrown overboard. Um, and in some cases, you know, the slaves, if, if the, they reached a storm, um, the slaves were chained together and thrown overboard to lighten the load uh, so that the ship would remain seaworthy. Um, and so, you know, lots and lots of horrible things about the Middle Passage have come to light. Um, and uh, some very good uh, monographs, you know, sort of tracing specific slave ships um, and other parts of the experience of the Middle Passage. Uh, two other issues briefly. Um, one of these is uh, the question of the African diaspora, right? Um, that slavery did create this globalized network of peoples who originate in Africa, whose lineage comes from Africa. And, uh, you know, the slaves often kept some aspects of their indigenous African culture alive. Um, we can see this in um, uh, some of the archaeology. Uh, Kingsley Plantation in Jacksonville, uh, for instance, has uh, there have you know, been some archaeology done there that have shown um, have uncovered evidence of African rituals that were conducted by the slaves, um, religious rituals where they tried to maintain some tie to their native uh, beliefs and their, you know, their, uh, the culture of their homeland. Um, uh, and, you know, some of this is, um, some of this is present in other, other evidence as well. I mean, the, you know, the songs the slaves sung often had African rhythms, African cadences and, and African tunes, um, dances, other things, right, were kept alive. And, and uh, so there is some African basis, certainly, for, you know, much of the, the culture of the African diaspora, though some of that has also been, in a way, uh, reinvented as, um, you know, people who are descended from former slaves have tried to get in touch with their African roots. And, you know, there's some really interesting cultural phenomena that come out of this, and the African diaspora is something that we will deal with, um, especially in the 20th century when we get to that part of the course where, I mean, there are these strong emotional and in some cases academic linkages between Africa, the Caribbean, the southern United States, and, and other places. Um, now, abolition as a movement um, is a complex thing. Uh, really more of a European phenomenon than an African one. Um, 
but uh, all through the 18th century, especially among some Protestant religious groups, there was opposition to slavery. Um, some political figures, uh, William Wilberforce in, in Britain, a member of parliament, uh, for instance, is one of the key figures here, um, took up a, a chorus of opposition against slavery. Um, and by 1806 in Britain, parliament had outlawed the slave trade, had done away with the slave trade. Now, slaves were still used on plantations in the British Empire uh, long after that, but um, you know, no more slave trading was allowed throughout the British territories, um, and Britain even began to actively try to disrupt the trade conducted by other countries, um, by France and Spain and, and Portugal um, and the United States, for that matter. Um, and so, you know, the French uh, finally commit to abolition in the 18, in the eighteen forties. You know, it's not until after the Civil War, of course, that, well, the United States uh, also did away with the slave trade, meaning people coming from Africa, but uh, still slaves were, of course, owned and, and uh, used, exploited um, in the Americas, and, or in the United States until uh, 1863, right? So um, abolition is this very slow process, um, but it is an important cultural movement, and uh, European abolition movements end up having dramatic consequences for uh, the way slavery worked in Africa. And uh, uh, we will talk about especially the beginnings of the 19th century in the next lecture. Um, and one of the key things we have to deal with there is the effects of abolition. So, Okay, uh, I mean, again, this was not a comprehensive treatment of the question of the transatlantic slave trade or any of the issues, um, and so hopefully this was not too much, uh, uh, too much complexity and, and too much information. Nor do I hope that that I ran. I hope that I didn't ramble too much about any of this. You know, hopefully, you have a better understanding at this point of the transatlantic slave trade than you did before you sat down to watch this. Um, and if you do have questions, comments, anything, I look forward to a vigorous discussion about this. Thanks.